Well, guess what? Asset frames and event frames are OSI Pi IP. They don't see it as your intellectual property. It's their intellectual right. property. So they do not expose the context and the normalization of the data outside of the OSI Pi ecosystem. It's one of my number one complaints. I'm like, wait. Um, and then I started having a serious conflict on the historian side. So I was watching OSI Soft, watching Asset Framework, Pi, uh, Pi Yes. And watching the stranglehold it was having on customers, yes. and and here's 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 the scenario. Now think that a lot of people haven't thought about this, but think about this: if you build your analytics framework inside of Pi on top of the historian, let's say you're really successful, you've got a competitive edge, you're going to acquire assets. Every time you acquire a new asset, and it's not using that historian. Right. That vendor, what do you have to do? Right. Well, it, it, what's even crazier is let's talk about event frames and asset frames and OSI Pi. My biggest complaint, my when people ask me, you know, Walker, why do you shit on OSI Pi? Well, it's really simple. It, you're going to build an event frame or an asset frame inside of OSI Pi to create value for your business. And that value is going to be data operations, context, and normalization of data. So you're going to transform data into information. You're going to give it context right. and you're going to normalize it in one event. You need that for machine right. learning later. You may, and when you first start your journey, you're not doing ML. You're doing connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize. ML starts later, yep. right? But you got to make sure that the way you do connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize sets you up to be able to do ML later. Okay. You're going right. to, in OSI Pi, ostensibly, you are going to use asset frames and event frames to get you data normalization and data context, which is the cleansing of the data for machine learning algorithms later. Well, guess what? Asset frames and event frames are OSI Pi IP. They don't see it as your intellectual property. It's their intellectual right. property. So they do not expose the context and the normalization of the data outside of the OSI Pi ecosystem. It's one of my number one complaints. I'm like, wait, you want me to use your platform to normalize and contextualize right. my data to get it to a single event, and then I, I can only use it in your platform? You've got to be kidding me. Right. That's a, you, like This is the argument where you and I would have at Canary all the time. Canary was wide open. It was literally, it was like, if you're going to build value inside of our platform, we're going to give you the ability to take it in its form and get it out to non-Canary partners. OSI Pi right. doesn't do that. In fact, they make it really, really, really hard, even if you decided you wanted to invest millions of dollars in doing it. When you look at flow, it's the same philosophy. The philosophy was, wait a minute, if you're going to create value in our platform, it's not value that stays in our platform. It's value we're going to expose to the ecosystem. And that is a yeah. fundamental, it's a fundamental shift That's what I ran in the market. That's what I ran into it. So here we are at Canary and we're seeing the necessity for asset framework, right? right? We, we see this need to analyze data at, at the historian level, but then you have this question of, well, we're a time series database. In order to really provide the needs of a, of a plant, we have so much relational and transactional data that needs to come in to be contextualized, to contextualize our time series data. And then it's like, well, does that make sense? Does it make sense to do all of that? And, and we thought, no, let's just make it really easy to export the data into whatever, wherever it needs to go. And then it's then this question, okay, well, where does it need to go? And that's where I saw Flow as being so such a capable tool. If they added the concept of tags, mm -hmm. and I, so I started way, talking to Graham, and they, they had measures to begin with. The measure was the object. They didn't have they right. didn't have tag structure, which has changed. That's the new right. right. That's the direction and, you pushed. And when I talked to Graham and when I talked to Graham about it and he was all on board about putting tags in, that's when I knew. That's when I knew. Okay, so we've got we've got a platform that doesn't care what the historian is, right? Doesn't care what the SCADA system is, doesn't care what the underlying version of SQL databases that you need to connect to, uh, can now capture real time data from an OPC server or an MQTT broker, and has an open interoperable um, platform that will send data on trigger, on schedule, on demand, um, or on change now to any other solution that I want it to go to. And forget, that's great. Forget, forget that though. It's not just sending the information that's been processed. 
it's the concept of I'm going to expose a single endpoint that anything in my ecosystem can ask me to go get raw data from any system I'm connected right. to, bring it into a standardized format, and then hand it off. So, and it, it, this is an important thing. So, it, you the, and we we actually had this in a diagram on the board. I didn't know that this was the direction they were going. This is a very yeah. important thing. Not only are you exposing the result of the work that you're doing inside of Flow you are also exposing the ability to create new workflows through flow mm -hmm. by exposing the endpoint. For example, if flow has uh, connections to three data sources, okay. And inside of the flow, inside the engineering environment, I went in there and I, I, what I did was I took three values from data source one, three values from data source two and one value from data source three. And then I created a couple of new parameters that are going to live inside of flow. Okay. And I, and I put those all together in a template. Okay. And then I, I do all my work in the, in the flow front end and then I execute it and I backfill all the data. And now what I've got is all these data points, my calculations, plus my outputs, all that's exposed. Right. That's and by the way, not everyone does that, but you guys do that. But here's the, 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 the right. ad. I also have the ability from outside of flow to hit flow and create a new workflow I can, from those three data sources. I can pick three new data points and I can do all those things outside of the flow uh, engineering environment, which the truth is, is doesn't exist. Like most platforms don't even think about that. Like it's also, we're so, it's like treating flow as a broker for all the data connections. And this is the, like, I've realized over the last year that we're in front of the market on this. Yes, definitely. Um, we're in front of it. We're, we're definitely in front of the need from the, the awareness of the need to ask for this feature. Um, but, and the difficulty you just ran into the thing that plagues me every day is trying to explain that concept mm -hmm. in less than 15 okay. seconds can be tough. I say it like this. Let's say in flow, you make a model of a throughput calculation. Uh -huh. You've got good, you've got bad tags representing rejects and, and, and good units. And now I've got that model at 10 sites. Every one of those sites is using a different vendor of historian. Right. I can ask flow to reach down to the historians and give me the raw data for good and bad right. for the last 90 days. Right. And Flow understands what that tag's called in the historian and how to query it. I don't ever have to do that as a data scientist ever again. Right. All you're doing and is going to the endpoint created in Flow that then goes to the raw data point. It creates the abstraction 